Hello and welcome to BTN's Take 10 Podcast. This is Alex here of BTN. This week's guest is former Wisconsin NFL defensive back Marcus Cromartie. Let's get into it. Take a look, listen, and enjoy. Look at here, look at here. With the catch, the finish! Oh my goodness, what a catch! Oh Energy, my goodness. enthusiasm. I'm very pleased to be joined by former Wisconsin NFL defensive bag Marcus Cromarty. Follow him on Twitter at Cromarty underscore M. And if you're watching on YouTube, you can see him flexing the Badgers shirt right now. Cro, what's up, man? How are you? What's going on, man? I'm doing great, man. You know I got a rep for my boys, games or no games. Absolutely. Uh, so, you know, update everybody on what you've been up to, man. Uh, you know, since we saw you in the league, since we saw you in Madison, Let's just take it all the way back to uh, your Badger days. Update everyone on, on what life's been like for you since your college uh, career. I mean, it's been good. You know, I had the opportunity to play in the NFL for a number of years. Um, I was professional for seven years, did six in the NFL, did one in the CFL to kind of wrap it up. And um, ever since then, it's just been about staying connected to sports. So I've been doing different talk pieces with different stations and, you know, just giving my opinions and, and doing what I love, and that's talk football. Absolutely. I saw uh, you've been very active, obviously, on social media lately. I plugged your Twitter there briefly. Um, and one of the undertakings that, you, that you've been doing is uh, this chat with Crow. And, and one of your chats went pretty viral recently with Melvin Gordon. Um, he had a quote about Chargers not having any fans in the first place. So it's not going to be that big of an adjustment to, uh, you know, have no fans in the stands during COVID. So Tell me about that undertaking, man, how you, uh, you know, have this kind of social media presence. You have a, a show. Tell, uh, tell the listeners about it and feel free to, to plug it. Yeah, um, well, it's Chat with Crow. You can always um, subscribe to my YouTube. You can go to um, my Instagram, Cromartie underscore M. But it was just a way to kind of connect um, with different guys. I know during COVID, everybody's been inside, so we haven't had the opportunity to get out. And, and people are just – urge for sports right now obviously we got basketball right now football's coming back in a week but um as you know the big 10 they were supposed to start their schedule some of the non-conference games were supposed to start today so this is just an opportunity for people to hear their favorite player and i thought why not melvin gordon i know he's been having um you know a, a tough time his last year with the contract but now he's ready to, to you know give his full go again and and uh it was funny because it was i did that interview in the beginning of COVID and. And I didn't know if I was going to get that soundbite or not, but it's funny because there isn't going to be any fans. You know, it was a guess at the time, but there isn't going to be any fans, at least at the start of the NFL season. But the Chargers are notoriously known for not having any type of true fans. So I know they've they seen it as a, a hit, but I thought it was just very funny. It was funny. And I'm curious, because you were a member of the Chargers, I believe. Um, I how do you feel about them moving to LA? How do you feel about that stereotype of them not having fans? Um, you know, I'd be upset personally if my NFL squad left. So I don't blame like San Diego fans for maybe not following them uh, right. up the interstate. So what are your thoughts on that whole situation? I will say this. I will say you get fans when you win. Unfortunately for San Diego, they, they had no Super Bowls. Um, and so I think with a fan base, you have to start winning. I will give you this example. The Patriots 20 years ago had no Super Bowls. And now all of a sudden they have, I believe, five. Um, five or six and it's like they have fans that came from everywhere now they have all these brand new fans it's, and it just starts with if you win fans will come and then you can kind of grow a culture from there uh, I didn't see that happening in San Diego they have a better chance in LA but I would say also say this they're not the team in LA right now so you know hopefully you know whether it's Tyrod Taylor or Justin Herbert they need to start a culture over there they need to get a guy who's going to be a quarterback there for 10, 15 years, like Tom Brady, like Phillip, you know, like Phillip Rivers almost, but they have to win because winning brings fans. Agreed. And I'm curious, you know, on that point, if you've been watching Hard Knocks at all with, with one of the, those uh, franchises, yeah, it's, it's interesting to, one, combine two, two teams in L.A. and kind of see the dynamics there. Um, what are your thoughts on, I guess, the, the show in general and, and what you've seen in this weird era of, you know, the masks and practice, the testing, 
the no fans and just everything that's kind of bundled into this experience? Yes, I would say this because just watching the NBA in the bubble, I wasn't quite happy with Vermont, you know, just the atmosphere of it because I feel like fans bring such a unique part of the game. I think it's the anxiety part of it. It's the, you know, playing in front of, you know, friends and family that you're just not going to see this year. But I would say that I guess little is better than none. And so let's, I will rewind also to say, I've heard that there hasn't been that many cases. The NFL has been doing a great job of minimizing cases. So that's a great thing. And I think that's going to be a good indication moving forward or if we can get fans into the stadium. But um, I've been watching the hard knocks. I would say this season hasn't been as great as the previous seasons you would have thought. Um, obviously, a lot of people kind of watch for, I guess, the episode coming when it's going to be like the cut dates and everything like that. We haven't gotten the, the great, I guess, um, antagonist, protagonist in, the, in this season, like the guy to kind of root for, like they have kind of pinned in, in like previous seasons. But, um, you know, I think, um, I think football in general, people are going to be excited to get it back. You know, it's a week from t- yesterday, actually, that is going to be the first game, the Thursday night football. So I think everybody's kind of excited. Uh, Hard Knocks was kind of dull this year, but we'll see. We'll see from the final episode. I mean, I can't wait. Uh, I love NFL season, and you know, it won't be the same, but I can't wait nonetheless. And with you having that experience, you know, in the league, and and you having experience of making teams, and also you know, trying to compete and make a team, mm-hmm. including you know, as a P squad player at times, get into if you could maybe the stress that comes with this time of year, and also maybe what opportunities might be lost now because there is no preseason right. and opportunities to showcase your skills and prove you deserve a spot on the team. Yeah, it sucks for the players now, definitely the young players. I will say this, the older you get, the more conscious you get on what's going on. When I was a younger player, my rookie, my second year, I was just going out practicing. I wasn't counting like how many corners are going to be on the team or how many, because you get into a, a thing, okay, they're going to keep six guys. Okay, they're going to keep five guys. I know he's on the team. I know he's on the team. And when you're old, it kind of gets in your head. So every practice you, you think, oh, I got to outdo him. Oh, I got to outdo him. Because, you know, that's how roster breakdowns are. You know, you're going to keep six corners, four safeties, you know, two quarterbacks, maybe three. Then that means they keep extra linebacks. There's a lot of counting going on, you know. So you can get confused. When I was a young player, my rookie year, my second year, I was just going out practicing. So I would say a younger player, you know, you're just going out trying to just do your best because you got so many things getting thrown at you as a rookie. You know, you got to learn the city and you got to learn the playbook. and You got to do all these kind of um, things throughout the day that they make rookies do. So your day is just so filled. You have no time to kind of stress. And um, but I will also say like those those rookies, they're not getting the same opportunity they, that I had got. I know for me personally, I showed up that second preseason game. When I kind of chased down, I had like a big effort play, and I chased down a kick return, and we got him down on the two, wind up holding him to a field goal. And so essentially the coach was like, well, you know, Cromartie kept four points off the board, you know, and that's what they love. They need to see those effort plays, especially for guys who's not drafted. And you don't get the opportunity, you know, doing two-hand touch practice, you know, every single day. Now, I'm sure they're throwing in live days, like live tackling, you know, um, periods for those guys, but it's not the same as having a four quarter preseason game, I'm having four, because I had the opportunity to play in four preseason games. I was playing at least 30 snaps in all of them. So that's just a lot of film I got. Yeah, I, I think I saw that uh, clip on your, your social media and your Twitter account. Um, I think it was against my Bears, so. Yeah, it was against your Bears, yeah. yeah so. And, and so it, it's just crazy because it's like, that's what they look for. They look for those effort plays. They look for those plays that's, because you, you need those type of players, especially once it's not drafted, you, you know, they, they're not going to immediately get their chance to be their um, per se position, whether that's corner, linebacker, receiver. So you got to make that team on special teams and then show through practice that you can also be a contributor on your, in your, you know, exact position. For sure. And anyone listening and they, they hear the name from Marty, you know, I think football player, defensive back, mm-hmm. uh, might also have heard of your, your relatives, your cousins that were in the league for a long time. Uh, Dominique Rogers Cromartie and Antonio Cromartie are household names at that position. And I, mean, I just got to ask, like, why are you guys all defensive backs? Like, is that a coincidence? Is that something that runs in the family? Is that some guidance that you guys pass along to each other? Just take me through that, uh, you know, family dynamic. 
you know, it's funny. I, I think it's coincidence, but I also think it's like ge a genetically our body is made to play corner. You know, we have long legs, long arms. Uh, we're fast. We're all fast, which is kind of like strange how there's no, there's not, not a slope. There's not nobody that runs a four, four, we're all four, three guys. And so <clears throat> and so I, it's just coincidence. And then when I got to college, that's when me and Antonio had just got, we got so close because I needed somebody to show me what it takes. Cause I remember, I would never forget the first time I trained with him. I was in, um, it was going to like my, my second year in college and I come out to LA cause he was training in LA. And it just surprised me how hard he trained for a guy who went first round. You would think this guy's first round, he got millions of dollars. You know, he's the starter. Like he was training like he was an undrafted rookie. He trained so hard and it kind of showed me what I needed to do when I got back to campus in order to separate myself in order to be successful at Wisconsin. I wish I would have, you know, I wish we would have been training when I was in high school. Like these players nowadays, they have such an advantage because they have these um, particular trainers. Like, I don't know that we, we're in this time where just everybody, these kids, they're doing seven on seven, they're doing football, you know, just from when they're little and they have these trainers that's training them. That's not even their coaches and not their high school coaches, but just trainers. They have their own gym. And they can come and they can get they can get better with me. And I know most of the guys, you know, that's my age, you know, 30 and plus, we had to kind of go through the high school system where you had your little high school coach, you had to maybe had a high school strength and conditioning coach, and then you go off to college and you never really knew what it took to get better. You were just following the the plan that was laid, you know, that was kind of laid um, before you. And so being but being around other athletes, being around professional athletes, and that opportunity I got to be around my cousins help grow my game. It is wild, yeah, all the opportunities now for, for training and, and development with guards at such young ages. Um, mm -hmm. You know, with these academies and, and prep schools, all that. Uh, exactly. You know, last point on the on the family lineage there, we think of some of the other famous football families, you know, you got the Mannings and the Watts. Where do you kind of rank you guys uh, up against some of the other well-known football families that, throughout history? It's funny that you asked that. Bleacher Report said we was the 10th most famous family in football, which is funny. They have the Mannings, the Clay Matthews, the Bosas, who they, they're making headway. And so mm -hmm. yeah, I think we're up there, though. Um, what people don't know is we have more than just football players. I know our great uncle, Warren Camardi, was a, was a pretty good baseball player for the Montreal Expos for 10 years. We have um, players that played in, like, the Negro League. So our lineage goes way back. And I just think sports and Cromarty, I know my son, he's going to follow up into the lineage. So we have just so many Cromarties that's just, you know, love sports. And um, I don't know where we rank, but I know we're definitely on the list. You talked about those 4 three forties, and I know the, the Watt brothers got that ultimate tag show on Fox. Tell me you guys can compete with them at least on that show. I know we can. I know athletically we can. And I would say that J.J. Watt is one of the most athletic guys I've been around. You know, I went to Wisconsin with him. This is a guy who can windmill dunk at like 6'7", 280. So... He's, in, you know, impressively athletic, but I know the Cromartis can keep up. All right, I had to get that, you know, I guess I had to get the Fox plug in there with the ultimate tag show and all that. Yeah. Um, shifting to a little more of a, a serious topic, you know, as I was scrolling and, and following your social media for as long as I've known you, which is now, you know, two or three months, um, there's been – a lot of uh, obviously change in the world during that time, and you've been active on social media, giving your thoughts, sharing your perspective. Um, you also were on on the 49ers during the Kaepernick era, and mm -hmm. you commented on on that. I saw a picture that you commented on that showed Cap kneeling during the anthem, and you were standing next to him. Mm -hmm. And I just want you to, if you could, share with the listeners what your perspective was and how it's maybe evolved. Because I know you you touched on why you didn't kneel at the time, but maybe how your perspectives evolved since then. So if you could just take us inside your head and, and sure. also comment on the, um, you know, the, the activism that you've shown in the last few months. Mm -hmm. Well, just to take it back to then, uh, it, was, it was such a great moment to be a part of because you kind of knew something special was happening. Um, Cap kneeled the game before, but it was a priest. He didn't kneel, I'm sorry, he sat. He sat on the bench the game before, which was the fourth priest in the game. And we knew going into that first game, which was a Monday night game, by the way. So it was going to be hot. Obviously, that's the most watched event of the week in TV, period, not just football. And so we knew it was going to be a big deal. So, you know, we had discussions in the locker room and discussions in the team meeting room of what was going to happen. And, you know, people, you know, shared their opinion and what they thought. And everybody 
came to the agreement that, okay, this isn't about disrespecting the country. It's about, you know, making uh, known the, the hypocrisies that's go that goes on in this country, making known, you know, the people that can't speak for themselves, the making known, like, you know, there's a lot of discrimination against people of color. So we knew that going into what was going to be the kneeling uh, game. And me standing next to him was standing in support. I remember he kneeled. They did the, you know, the anthem, and we all came and we hugged together. That was the next moment. And, um, and people ask me all the time, would you have changed what you've done? And I always say, oh, well, I don't know. I don't think so. Because to me, there's different ways that you can protest. I have nothing but respect for Colin. I thought what he did was the right thing. For me personally, I had a family that depended on me. That was the most money I was going to make in a year. I had a newborn son, a newborn son being born in about two months. So I couldn't risk, I couldn't take those same risks. Like Colin took a risk and he took a risk and he, and he um, stood on his, on his morals and I have to do nothing but respect that. But I'm also not going to criticize anybody that didn't nail because any, everybody can show their own form of activism the way they feel like they can best reach you know, people. And some people's form of activists may be like going to city hall and you know, causing a ruckus or you know, making foundations that gives back to the black community or just using the social media. There's so many different forms of protest. Um, Collins was to kneel and, every, and you know what, he got so much uh, criticism for it at the time, but if we only knew that what he was doing wasn't, you know, riding, he wasn't, you know, speaking bad on anybody. He was just showing that, hey, look, I'm not gonna agree with what's going on in America. And I think we need to bring this to the forefront. I think it started a healthy conversation that we need in this country for years. Yeah, and four years later, I mean, look how far the discussion yeah. has come. And it's, exactly. it's just insane that, you know, you were right in the middle of it. Another profound experience that you were involved in and, and I'm, I assume had a significant impact on your life was uh, having to relocate in mm -hmm. the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. Yeah. Um, can you take us through that experience, where you ended up, um, you know, what it was like leaving New Orleans behind and how it affected, you know, how the, how the rest of your life has played out, including ending up in Wisconsin. Yeah, it's, it's such a, um, it starts off as a, like a funny story. Uh, I was 15 years old, I was in 10th grade. Um, uh, we just finished like the first week or first two weeks of school uh, at my school in New Orleans. You know, we get these tests and we get these like quiz that like the second week of uh, school. And I absolutely failed the quiz, like F. And it was one of those times where you had to get the quiz signed by your parents, like the results signed by your parents and they know that they have seen it. So the whole weekend, I'm like, oh, I gotta show my dad this quiz that I failed, oh my gosh. And then leading up to that Monday, we get the announcement on Sunday that it's a mandatory evacuation, which means everybody in the city has to leave. Now imagine everybody in the city or like wherever you live, Chicago, LA, trying to leave at one time. So it is like bumper to bumper traffic leaving the city. Um, is we was going, they, they shut down the I-10. The I-10 runs east to west. They shut it down. So the only way you can go is north. So we're going to north to Memphis, which is about five hours. It took us 13 hours to get there because of traffic. 13 hours, you are seeing cars on the side of the road because they ran out of gas because there was so much traffic. It was just uh, uh, insane. And I think as a 15 year old kid, you just kind of going with the flow. I was just, in my mind, I'm like, man, I'm gonna get a few days off school. I don't gonna show my dad this quiz right now and kind of kind of prolong it. He never seen the quiz, by the way. You know, that one, he never wanted to see it because I never went back to the, you know, never went back to the school, never went back to the city. We go to Memphis for like <clears throat> a week or two, a week or two, and we kind of seeing like the, we're like standing in like a motel. And we're like looking at the TV and it's like, man, this is the worst than we imagined. And I left my dad, my mom, she went, she went north as well, but she kind of went north Louisiana. The cell phone towers go down. We can't even get in touch with her to, to know she, if she's even okay. Because like the cell phone towers were just down in Louisiana, you know, obviously, thank God she was fine. But, um, you know, we kind of see the hurricane. Both of my parents' jobs are destroyed by, you know, flood damage. It's like, like what are you going to do now? And so my dad's job got relocated to Texas. So after spending two weeks in Memphis, we, uh, we go down to Dallas, Texas, and uh, we're living in a hotel for the first three months. And I'm driving, like he's driving me to school every day. And like I said, it was just kind of like, you know, you're just going with the flow. You just don't know because 
And, and it, honestly, it tells me to take advantage of life because you can be in a moment one day and just can, your life can be completely changed the next. And that's honestly what happened. Um, I was fortunate enough to be surrounded by people that cared about me when I got to Texas, and that helped me succeed. Um, uh, as you know, there's no football like Texas. So the talent is going if – if you're talented in Texas, you're going to shine, you're going to get scholarships. That not, that's not saying that, that you can't do that in Louisiana. It's just so much harder. And so I had the opportunity to go down to Texas, um, be around coaches that cared about me, that, that wanted the best for me. Uh, it wound up being a blessing in disguise because obviously I, I was able to garner scholarships, um, go to the school that I chose, which was the University of Wisconsin, and it all worked out. But um, I only can feel for those guys. And, um, and honestly, I got to give so much credit to just my parents for, for keeping it all together because it was a very traumatic experience for so many people. And um, you just have to look at it. And I know it's, part, it's a part of my story, but I always look at the glass half full. And um, I, took, I took advantage of my opportunity and, uh, and it all worked out at the end of the day. Yeah, just a just an insane story with you know, you, you don't expect there to be a, a joke in there, but the quiz the, the quiz element is <laughs> oh my gosh hilarious. I did not want to show him that quiz. I was so glad I did it. He never seen that quiz. I never went back to the school. It was just like well, because in, in your mind as a fifteen year old kid, and I know these kind of kids probably um, dealt with that a little bit with COVID. Is that okay when the lockdown first happened? It's like yes, like no school. And then it's like, when, when are we getting back to school? You know, at, at, in my mind, it was like a three-day vacation because we're used to hurricanes in New Orleans. Like, but, you know, you get two, three days off school, and then you'll be right back. You know, that used to happen, like, almost every year. And so, but this time, we get, you know, you just never went back. And so, you know, as just as a 15-year-old kid, it initially started off as, wow, yes, okay, I get some time off of class, I get some time off of school until, until man, like, you know, having to drive 40 minutes to school every day, you know, wearing the same clothes for a while because you don't have no clothes. All your clothes is either, you know, destroyed or, you know, not with you. So it was, um, it was definitely humbling. And then being, in, you know, around new kids and, and, you know, some kids, you know how kids are in high school, like they making fun of you because you're from New Orleans and you talk different. And, um, you know, they making jokes about the hurricane. It's just, you know, that's what kids do. So you had to just kind of, um, you know, go with the flow and, like I said, it was traumatic for some, but I made the best of it. Yeah, I can't compare the situations at all, obviously, but I, I do remember when COVID started, like you said, me and my coworkers were like, oh, sweet, you know, two weeks at home. Mm -hmm. It sucked because the tournament uh, got canceled for basketball. Like, that was the big bummer, but we're like, at least we can go home and relax. Right. And haven't gone back since, so. Exactly. Uh, Six, eight was, months later. Yeah, those Six, expectations eight. being skewed. Um, Marcus, um, I want to get into your Badger playing days um, before I let you go. No and I usually ask this because usually my guests know right away or have something that sticks out to them uh, when it comes to like their favorite or most vivid memory mm -hmm. from your playing days. And I'll even extend it to like off the field as well. So if you, if you have an on field memory and an off field memory that stick with you, that when you look back at your playing days, you're like, you know, just still resonates with you to this day. Uh, I'd love to hear them. Yeah, man, I get goosebumps just thinking about those days because there's so, so many, honestly. And you never really know until you look back. Um, in 2010, when we beat the number one team, Ohio State, uh, that always rings to me because I remember we, we, we took the opening kickoff back. And it just that was just the start of it. And I just remember, you know, the coach, um, Chris Ash, who's now the defensive coordinator at Texas, that meeting room, and him just saying, this is going to be a special day for you guys. You have no idea. And we beat the number one team in the nation. They stormed the field. Like, people were hanging on goal poles. It was such an incredible night. October, so, like, the weather's perfect. It was just – um, it was special. That day, um, it was just so many. Like, uh, the Big Ten championship games, all – I mean, all – well, it was two Big Ten championship games. And then when we clinched versus Penn State in, that, in 2010, it just – all those games are just so special. So, with the roses in the locker room, you know, the coaches are happy. Um, I had a pick six in one of them, so it's just especially happy. Uh, one of the Big Ten championship games, we won was on my 21st birthday. So it's just so many, like, things that's connected to my identity through, through Badger Sports. And um, uh, uh, another moment was when, um, when our coach, Brett Bielema, left for Arkansas my senior year. We got the chance to be coached by Barry Alvarez for the Rose Bowl, so just the nostalgia with that. And 
having him on the sideline as a coach and, you know, it's just the, the amount of players I play with, like we still go back, me and my friends still go back and talk about like, man, we had like Russell Wilson, we had J.J. Watt, we had Melvin Gordon, James White, Monty Ball. We had just so many players that um that we we and we didn't notice in the time. Cause we I guess our coaches was keeping us humble by the way we practiced. We practiced so hard at the University of Wisconsin. Um, I, I don't think um people understand like the, the the intensity that you have to have to play in the Big Ten because it's a it's a tough tough conference, especially in October, November when it gets colder and the teams are running the ball down your throat. And so uh, there's so many memories. Um, but like I said, the Ohio State game in 2010, when we beat them as, as, as no one team in the nation, um, the 2011-2012 um, um, Big Ten championship games. How about like a brush with either celebrity or fame or just something cool? Like even the Barry Alvarez moment is a good example. Um, I remember talking to Jeremy Langford few weeks ago on the podcast and he brought up when they went to LA for the Rose Bowl and like Rich Homie Kwan was on stage with them. So did you ever get like a like social media shout out, a text from an unexpected person or like a brush with, you know, some some sort of uh, celebrity that you didn't really expect or kind of caught you off guard that you now you look back on and you're like, wow, that was that was pretty sweet. Well, like like you said, the whole Rose Bowl experience is amazing. Um, fortunately there's a lot of people that love the University of Wisconsin. So I remember the first Rose Bowl in 2010 we had the opportunity to meet the cast from The Entourage, which is a big HBO show. Uh, and at the time, The Entourage was one of the top shows on TV. Great show. Uh, it was a great show. And I uh, got a chance to be around Doug Ellen, who's the, the producer and the, the writer of the show. And he had this cast. And, you know, he had guys like Turtle. I, remember, I don't know if you remember him from Entourage and just um, okay. drama. Yeah. It, it, it was just incredible time, incredible experience. You know, you've seen these guys on the big screen and having them at practice and them being fans of you. And knowing who you are and be like, man, I love when you played that game versus me. like, man, you watch that? And so it's just like extremely humble, extremely humbling and just exciting to just to be around guys that you watch on TV. Absolutely. And we uh, talked about it earlier in the discussion, but you keep up with Melvin Gordon, obviously. You, you mentioned some of those other guys that you, you know, you played with at Wisconsin. Who, who's kind of the, the guys in the group chat that you still keep up with the most? Um, I keep up most, and it's funny because most of my friends are, are coaches now, like Aaron Henry, who's the, the defensive back coach for Vanderbilt, um, Jay Belay, who's the defensive back coach for UT, you know, Antonio Finellis, who's the, um, the D coordinator at the, at the school he's at, so, and Shelton Johnson. But to be honest with you, I take pride in staying connected with the, the Badger players because former and current, because I feel like having that network of guys and, and not just through football, through all sports, but having, but especially football, having that network of guys to know, hey man, like I was in your shoes once. So if you're, if you're playing now, you're going to be in my shoes one day. And so why not like, you know, show each other love. Like, be like look, man, if, you, if you're here, you want to get lunch, we get lunch, let's talk. And so I take pride in, you know, being that guy that, that wants to keep the, I guess the, the fraternity together. And um, so like you said, like, I'm, I'm constantly reaching out to those guys, Aaron Henry, Jay Belay, Melvin Gordon, um, Monty Ball, uh, Lance Kendricks. Um, and, and, you know, just, just – and not just, the, you know, players that were successful at Wisconsin, even guys who didn't play much. And so, you know, like I said, keeping that fraternity strong and keeping that Badger, that Badger family tight. For sure. And you mentioned Monty Ball. Uh, when I first met you, it was on Zoom with yourself, Monty Ball, and, and Kenny Bell from Nebraska. Um, you guys were having a good time reflecting. and. Uh, I know you also, you know, have a close connection with Monty and some of his uh, his darker times and his struggles. Uh, I know you you wrote about his his battle with alcoholism and and Badger fans, I'm sure, know his story a little bit and how it affected his NFL career and, and life off the field. So if you could touch on uh, on that story a little bit and why you personally got, are, are so invested in in you know his battle and now his recovery from alcoholism. Well, yeah, I wrote a story called Behind the Eight Ball, the Monty Ball story. And it, and it just kind of detailed um, his journey from uh, college to the NFL and his struggles. And I played with Monty. I was with Monty his entire um, college career. So that became one of my tight friends, close friends. And I was also with him during some of those nights. Um, not, not, not those nights where, he, you know, he got in trouble with the law, but I remember, I don't know if you remember his senior year when it was a big deal when he got um, jumped by two men. We was, I was with him 
moments before that night, you know, I was like, okay, money, are you okay? Can you get home? He's like, yeah, like, I'm good. Like, I'm gonna walk home. I'm like, sure, because I had a car. He's like, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna go home. And so 15 minutes, I didn't even get home yet. 15 minutes later, I'm getting a call saying Monty just got jumped. He's on his way to his hospital. And i um, not saying that's alcohol related, but it just, those stories always surrounded him from that point, from that moment on. It was just, you know, everything, all the struggles in his life were surrounded by alcohol. And at first, you know, as a college, you know, somebody in college, we all drank, you know, most, most people drink. And so you think it, it's just, uh, you know, part of a lifestyle. And, um, but, but it's really deeper for money for that. His, you know, his, his father's alcoholic, uh, his grandfather was alcoholic. And so it's just discovering the genetics behind it. Now, clearly, you know, people would say, oh, well, nobody's forcing him to drink. And that's true. But when you're genetically exposed to it, mixed with the cultural influences of just being in college, being a star athlete, uh, it's just, you're more point, you know, you're just more likely to become what your family is. And so, um, the stories about how he, you know, he struggles from, you know, them, them NFL days of, you know, drinking every day, drinking three times a week, you know, literally going to the sauna the day before games and just sweating all his alcohol out just so he can play and how that caught up to him eventually and led to some of his legal troubles. And, um, but, you know, fortunately for Monty, he started his organization, uh, Untapped Keg, about, you know, not drinking anymore. He's been sober for over two years, so he's doing a lot better. Uh, and it's not just a story about um, alcoholics, it's a story about mental health in general. We live in this time where athletes are just so, we see them at, almost as superheroes and they're not allowed to, you know, struggle mentally. You know, there's a lot of people that's depressed out there, whether that's through alcoholic, uh, alcoholism or anything, you know, we don't know what's going on in, in, in people's life. You know, obviously we just seen the horrific passing of uh, Chadwick um, Boseman and nobody knew he had cancer. So it just goes to show you that you never know what's going on in somebody's life. Uh, we should be easier on people. Uh, mental health is a, a big issue right now. And so um, the story, again, is called Behind the Eight Ball and the Money Ball Story. Um, I'm looking to get it um, publicized soon. I, I think it's an amazing story. It has um, some, some, you know, it has uh, some positives to it. You know, uh, I think people's lives shouldn't be judged on the, the, the worst thing they did. Yeah, well said. I, I read the story and... Um... It was very well done and powerful, and uh, you know I have no doubt that it'll it'll uh, get out there for everyone else to read soon. And you know you talked about also some of the the good memories that Wisconsin fans have of Monty, and just how don, dominant he was as a cr part of a great cradle of running backs. Obviously, Wisconsin has an amazing history of running backs. So I have a little thought exercise for you now mm -hmm. I like to do this with, uh, especially you know my football and basketball guests that that, that played. Um, trying to build the ultimate Wisconsin running back, and you can you can double up if you want, but I'm gonna list some attributes, and I want you to name which okay. legendary Wisconsin running back uh, you know fits in there. You got obviously your Melvin Gordon, your Monty Ball, your Ron Danes to choose from, uh, James White, plenty of guys that that uh, could fill this this list out. But we'll start with the speed category. If you had to go with one legendary Wisconsin running back for speed, who are you picking? I'll probably say the speed of Jonathan Taylor. Okay. Yeah, I didn't even list Jonathan Taylor there because I, you know, you know <laughs> I can only name so many guys in my head because they've been so good. But uh, JT was incredible as well. How about power? The power of Ron Dane. Blocking ability. The blocking ability of, of Monty Ball, for sure. How about pass catching out of the backfield? Um, James White, easy. All right. How about like the overall wiggle, agility? Just able to a looseness has to be Melvin Gordon, and a, and, then, and then the ability to fall forward again would be Monty Ball. I think it, I think if you get the perfect back, you got the the power of Ron Dane, the speed of Jonathan Taylor, the looseness and agility of Melvin Gordon, the pass catching of James White, and just the overall awareness of Monty Ball. He just like to me, Monty was so good at just knowing when to hit the hole knowing how to bounce off defenders. I feel like that's a key a component when it comes to being a good running back. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to do it with those answers, make a little graphic about it. And I think it's going to blow people away just to, like, see that level of greatness at one position. Oh, one's, my gosh. It's incredible. So look, for, look out for that. We'll, uh, we'll tweet it your way. Okay, and I don't wait. think anyone can disagree with your, uh, your picks there. Um, all right, before we wrap up, Crow, uh, you know, I, I have to ask about – your college experience in Madison, Wisconsin, because I always go on record saying that it's like 
got everything a college town sh should have. It's, in my opinion, probably the best in the U.S. when the weather is nice. Um, so, like, you know, you got obviously we know you got the lakes, you got downtown, the Capitol Building, State Street, all that good stuff. The campus is gorgeous. What's something about the the campus or the town that's maybe underrated or something you might need to be a student or athlete to know about that you really like about Madison? Um, so it's funny that you asked. I just went back to Madison for the first time in October, first time since I graduated. So it's been like seven years. So last year was the first time I went in seven years. And it just brought back so many good feelings of nostalgia, so many good feelings of why I chose to be there. Um, I think the one thing that's underrated about the school is just for one, I think it's the people. And then that goes from not just the students, but your professors. And there's just those interactions that you have with those people. Um, the good thing about Madison is, is it, it's more of a melting pot in the capital. It reminds me a lot of Austin, Texas, honestly. Um, I don't know if, if people are familiar with Texas. It's a state that, you know, certain people that they, they think a certain way, but then you get to Austin, you got more eclectic of people. You got more people that think different ways and, uh, and they show it by their actions as well. And I think you kind of have that same thing as Madison, you know, uh, regardless of what you think about people from Wisconsin, I think the people in Madison, Wisconsin are, are good people. And so uh, I think it's, um, I had an extreme amount of respect for the people that teach, that my professors, um, my mentors uh, at Wisconsin and just my, my students themselves and just, it's just an incredible experience. Like you said, the lakes are amazing. Um, just the, when the weather is nice. And yes, we get those bad days. It's like negative 20 and, you know, and, and, and things like that. But I just think, man, that, that experience of playing for a big school in the Big Ten uh, at a university that's known for, you know, eating cheese curds and drinking beer, it just, it got me out of my comfort zone and it, and it taught me something. That was uh, that you can meet people that's not like you y'all can share a lot a lot in common yeah and one thing you don't have to deal with anymore i don't think is with that that weather those negative 20 degree temps i, uh, I know you're, you're out in southern california now la area um you said on our previous zoom call that i think i'm pretty sure i got this right that the rose bowl kind of influenced your decision to eventually live out there and then of like course. by the second you know by the the second trip out there to the rose bowl you already knew like all the club promoters and all that so my <laughs> My question is, uh, how, how much have you, like, kind of fallen into the L.A. stereotype trap? Like, are you out there eating avocado toast, like, reading scripts? Oh, just, my gosh. Just off overall in general, you know, just out around the edges. Like, what, what's, uh, what's your L.A. experience like, and do you fall into any of those just kind of L.A.? I, I, I definitely have taken in the culture a little bit. Um, I went vegan for, like, 40 days this year. Um, I definitely, I have friends that's active, so I'll definitely read lines with them. So I, I've, I've definitely accustomed to the culture. It's so funny because I've been out here for seven years, but I've been holding on to my um, Texas license for, the, for forever. And I finally switched to a California license. Like, okay, I'm officially a California. And I will remind you the story uh, when I, for the first Rose Bowl, I will never forget because it was 25 degrees and snowing in Madison. It was a Christmas day because we leave usually a week before the game. So a week before January 1st is around Christmas time. And so we leaving to go to LA, it's 25 degrees and snowing. We touch down in LA, it's 75 degrees. And I will never forget, I said, I will live here one day. So fast forward to, you know, 2020 and I'm here and I'm, um, you know, vegan and I'm, I'm, I'm telling them avocado, all my meals, even if it's steak, I don't care. You know, <laughs> it's, I definitely come accustomed, accustomed to living in LA, you know, it's not a bad thing. I think, you know, they have good people out here. Um, it's, it's good to, to travel to Wisconsin, travel to the Midwest, but I can't ignore my 75 days. I'm about to go take a, a run after this meeting, and it's 85 degrees right now, so it's amazing. All right, well, I'm not jealous right now because it's still kind of summertime shy around here in Chicago. Uh, yeah, I think it's the best summer city, or the best, you know, best city in the U.S., but also the best summer city in the world. But when it gets to, to January, I'll definitely be a little jealous. Uh, <laughs> So, Crow, I appreciate it, man. I appreciate no you sharing so much of, uh, you know, your insight. There's some sensitive topics for sure, but also just reflecting on your playing days, keeping it real with us, and uh, taking some time out of a beautiful Friday in Los Angeles. No problem, man. Appreciate you having me. Uh, much love always. Thanks. So really. All right. Thanks once again to Marcus for joining the show really appreciate him jumping on like I told him at the end there um, you know I, I appreciate it extra when 
not only is there a great discussion, but when the guest is willing to dive into some uncomfortable topics, or maybe not uncomfortable, but at least some some sensitive ones, and um, you know, you see why he's handled them so well over the years because he clearly uh, has, has approached all those you know situations in a thoughtful way and. And, you know, having a perspective altered like that at such a young age with Katrina and then being right in the middle of the Kaepernick situation and you know, seeing a friend like Monty Ball go through what he did, it's, it's, uh, it was very interesting to hear his perspective on, on all those situations and also just hear him talk about playing football and playing in Wisconsin and his NFL experiences. So clearly a guy uh, who's good for some great discussion and would love to have him back on again at some point. So shout out to, uh, shout out to Marcus for that. Um, appreciate everyone sticking with the show throughout these still weird and uncertain times in college sports and for BTN. Um, obviously, we hope that uh, we can return to play safely soon. But, um, you know, regardless of when that happens, we'll continue to have guests on regularly on the show and talk sports and have good discussions and uh, churn out some content for the masses on social media and on YouTube as well. I mentioned it to, to Marcus, but... Uh, if you have not been following the show, it is available on YouTube, on Big Ten Network's YouTube channel. There's a Take 10 podcast playlist. So for everyone out there who might be just listening to this audio-wise, nothing wrong with that. But if you'd like to see the guests, you can do so on the Take 10 podcast uh, playlist on YouTube. So wonders of Zoom have pushed the podcast forward. And I uh, really like you know getting to see the guests as well and see their reactions. Uh, if you don't want to do youtube you can always find the show where podcasts uh are found on apple podcasts google play podbean spotify um we're on most platforms so shouldn't be too hard to find if you want the audio version uh, beyond that i want to give a shout out not only to the fans and uh listeners out there but also to julie bronder my producer for helping to produce the show really appreciate that uh jordan Gisellis, who's designed the look for the graphics and the um the segments that we share on social media appreciate him as always and we will be back at you soon with another uh, new guest and conversation on the take 10 podcast so stay tuned and take care stay healthy and safe until then